Sport. Also, ähm, guten Morgen hier auf der Aero E-Flight Expo, äh, der Messe der Ultraleichten und der Allgemeinen Luftfahrt. Wir haben das Thema ähm, 600 Kilo, wie geht's weiter, äh, gewählt. Und ich würde jetzt zum Englischen wechseln, weil wir haben sehr viele internationale Gäste da. Und äh, Jan Friedrich äh, vom LA in Tschechien äh, spricht sehr gut Englisch, versteht zwar einiges an Deutsch, aber doch nicht alles. Das heißt, wenn Sie Probleme haben, das Ganze zu verstehen oder es nochmal nachhören wollen, wir zeichnen das Ganze auch auf und äh, Sie können, geben die Internetadresse später bekannt, sodass Sie das dann äh, im Internet nochmal nachhören können. So, I, now I change to English. As the Aero Fair is an international fair, the 600 kilograms in Europe is an international subject and we have a lot of guests from other countries. We will do this discussion here in English. So we also record it and we will put it to the internet. So if you have anything which you didn't understand, you always can re-listen to it later. If you want to ask questions later in the discussion in German, no problem at all. But uh, the basic language we will use on the podium today here is English. May I introduce now uh, on my uh, right hand side, Jan Friedrich from Czech Republic. He is the vice president of LAA. Um, as he is a guest from outside, he is first. Uh, and uh, he was very much involved in the 600 kilograms together with Joe Conrad, uh, president of the DULF, the German Ultralight Association. And actually they both together, although they, you will listen that at some point they have a different opinion, they made it happen that we got this 600 kilogram because they were pushing a lot. And I think it's a very big step for the ultralight community in Europe because it adapts the rules to the reality. Most of you know that a lot of the ultralights up to now have been too heavy and so now we have the chance to do, but the thing is basically there has been made a decision, but the people will explain how it is. So Jan will present a quick PowerPoint presentation with his point of view, then Joe will give his point of view and then I will ask some questions and you're very welcome to ask questions as well. Um, we have a third point because most of you, when you're in the subject, you know that from the French side, the French, had a, the French Association had a little different point of view. Unluckily, they couldn't make it to this uh, subject, uh, to this podium discussion here. They only will be here tomorrow. But if you have questions to the French Association, they will be uh, available tomorrow at 2.30 p.m. at our booth at the A7 Flying Pages, uh, A7 101, right next to the Siemens booth. So if you have questions to the French point of view, uh, you can ask this later. Unluckily, they couldn't make it to the podium. And now I hand my word to Jan Friedrich. Good morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very pleased to be here. Dobré ráno, dámy a pánové, jsem velmi rád, že jste tady. I speak little Czech because there is many Czech uh, people here as well. So, uh, I think that's important. Uh, as you know, together with Joe Conrad, for past two years, we held the presentations here in Cairo, which were called 600 Kilo Myth and Reality. And I think now I'm very happy that uh, really accepted uh, or organized this forum for us that some of the things are shortly becoming the reality and there are still a lot of myths. So don't afraid to ask because we are here to try to answer. Uh, I prepared a short presentation which will try to give you the overview of the Czech position to the current uh, situation. As you maybe know, in Czech Republic, uh, the Civil Aviation Administration is divided between the Light Aircraft Association of the Czech Republic, which is responsible for everything up to uh, 450 kilogram current ultralights or 600 kilo LSA, which we have, but they must be amateur built, 
or 560 kilogram gyroplanes. The remaining part is, belongs uh, to the Czech Civil Aviation Authority. We expect that when 600 kilo will become the reality, the LAA will still be responsible for everything up to 600 kilo, which in Czech is called sport flying equipment. And our government a little bit surprised us, and they said the Czech CAA will be responsible for airplanes to 600 kilo. So you can see that many people think that we won if we have 600 kilo, but as you know, the devil is in the details, and this is the great opportunity to our uh, sort of opponents to try to steal the success which we had with our uh, ultralight uh, category. So, and now the tricky part comes. All this is possible because of the new basic regulation, which is basically opening the door to 600 kilo in the formula, uh, in the paragraph 7a in uh, article 2, which basically gives the member states the opportunity to so-called opt out for 600 kilo. This practically means that the member states can decide what would be regulated on a member state level and will be exempted from EASA regulations. The interesting thing on this is that during the many years discussions, this 600 kilo possibility was always the part of uh, Annex 2 or now in the new one because the Europe likes rename and renumber everything, so old Annex 2 is now be become Annex 1 and what used to be basic regulation 216, 2008, nobody knows what will be the number because it's still not, the, not approved, so hopefully it will be something slash 2019 or 18, sorry, but nobody knows. And this exemption is possible for maximum takeoff mass 600 kilo, uh, or 650 kilogram at sea, two seats and 44, uh, 45 knots, which is 83 kilometers per hour, stall speed in landing configuration, and then also for rotorcraft 600 kilo, two seats, and gliders 600 kilo, two seats. So member states will just notify the European Commission that they are using this opt-out possibility. The airplanes, which are already certified by EASA, will not be affected by this. Uh, and manufacturers can choose if they will follow the European rules or the national rules. This hopefully will be approved by European Parliament maybe in May or June, but nobody knows because sometimes the politicians have different agenda. And the former Annex 2, now Annex 1, is practically unchanged. There are some changes to the weight of ultralight gliders, uh, 600 kilo for uh, gyros and, 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 and so on, but small thing. So this is what enabled this possibility for opt-out. But as I said at the beginning, this is also opening the possibility that the member states, if they will not be, I would say it clearer, can create a situation that we will have 31 different definitions of opt-out and we would be in much worse situation because the manufacturers will need to adapt to all these different regulations. So we did a lot of work to try to unite this situation. That's why at the beginning the discussion was what is the current problem of the ultralight? As already Willy knows and you, everybody knows it, the microlights have a problem that they don't have under the current definition they don't have enough uh, payload. The payload is not realistic, you know. There is not many 70 kilogram pilots or even 75 kilogram pilots and so on and so on. That's why we, for the politicians, we made a, some sort of simple pro, uh, formula which we said we need a realistic payload. And the realistic payload, according to our opinion in Czech Republic, is 200 kilo pilots plus 50 kilo for batteries or for fuel because we need the solution also for the electric flights because the ultralight regulations are much more flexible and allows better development of new things. Under EASA I don't think that there will be many uh, startups 
going for the electric flight. So, I thought that this is simple, easy to understand, there is no need for the new regulations because it is enough to adapt the existing ones. If we have a system for initial airworthiness, continuing airworthiness, operations and everything, there is really no need to create a new such regulations. By the way, in Czech Republic we already solved this problem about five years ago when we established LSA category, which at that time could be only amateur built, but our government said, ha, huh, you can keep your ultralight licenses. So in Czech we have a legally ultralight licenses to 600 kilo and we are not opening this discussion about any licensing. There is no need to discuss about airports or, or things like that, really. Only thing which needs to be adjusted is these three or four numbers in the initial airworthiness. Then the physics is all the time the same. But, as I said, devil is in the details. Unfortunately, some of our colleagues on the international scene has different opinion. And the strongest sort of voice is coming from France, which they say, we don't like 600 kilo because those are no more ultralights. And they start to play with these kinetic energy things and so on. At the beginning, 450 kg was untouchable. Now they move it to 500 kg plus uh, 25 kg for rescue system plus 10% for floats plus 5% for skis. So the poor manufacturer who wants to sell to France must design the plane to 550 kg. Even on a paper without the skis and it's 50. But what is worse, is that they said we will keep 65 km per hour. So, the result of that, the planes in France will need to have a bigger wing area. And then, the idea of having a unified market, because now we have a chance to create a one regulation on, based on these new figures, because the most problem in the past flying from country to country, recognizing the type certificates from country to country, was based, were based on a different definition for the airworthiness and mainly for the weights, for the empty weight. Now we had a chance to have a realistic one and it looks like that somewhere, you know, we need to work a little bit more to achieve this goal. So this is the French position. So as you can see on the current map, this is the map which I created based on a voting which happened in the European Council Aviation Working Group on April uh, 12, uh, 2017. So it's one year old, so it's not latest. Maybe some countries change their opinion. But you can see those who are in purple, they have a different view on 600 kilo. And we are not sure how this will look like. But also talking from a little bit from the point of view of Lama Europe, the manufacturers, if you see this map and you see so many different variants of the market, I am a little bit seasick because then it would be difficult for a manufacturer to design the plane on a proper weight and it would be expensive for you as a customer to fly with these planes. And basically that's my introduction of the problem. Okay, so uh, we now heard a lot about the problem, but I think we also, like you mentioned, only very short that we have achieved the big step and we have a solution so perhaps we now uh, hear uh, Joe's point of view and then um, perhaps we could see what I think is very interesting for the for you and for all the other people flying with ultralight in Europe what is the current situation what has to be done what uh, with a manufacturer when you have an existing aircraft you want to uh, modify this aircraft to 600 kilograms so what has to be done in Germany, what has to be done in the Czech Republic, will this be similar? I think these are very practical questions uh, which um, I want to ask, but perhaps Joe, you perhaps give us a little general overview how you see the situation and perhaps also an estimation how it was uh, over the last two years. Thank you, Willy. Um, yeah, from my point of view, um, it is that I'm not as concerned as uh, Jan uh, is, because I think it's an old game for us. Uh, with our ultralights, we had uh, 
decades, uh, this came with different requirements for licensing, technical requirement, and so. And then we do the next step with this uh, 600 kilogram category. I think it is uh, the good way what uh, Jan uh, is proposing or, or suggesting that we should try to find uh, a common rule for Europe. Uh, because otherwise it's too difficult for the manufacturers uh, to do in each country the full catastrophe with type certification process and so on. That's clear. But on the other hand, I think it's a running train. So first we have to step into 600 kilogram and then we have to develop the game, how we will play this. Uh, so, and I'm a little bit more optimistic. If I, if I may comment that, uh, I slightly have a different opinion because I think when the train is running, to change anything is very difficult. I would prefer to change the things before the train starts running, and then we can run the train. Uh, but uh, perhaps I. Uh, uh, I think there are two points of view which we, we have here. Um, perhaps we can go a little bit back to the technical details, just uh, simple. So if somebody, for example, has an existing aircraft which has a certain weight, now 472.5, uh, and it was certified after this, not a new aircraft, he has an existing aircraft, but the manufacturer is proving that uh, the aircraft can have the higher weight, as there are several aircraft which also has been certified to a higher weight, what would be the procedure? Would it be possible to fly with this aircraft already with a higher weight, or would it be only possible with new aircraft? So first Joe, and then Jan, perhaps. Yeah, this is the question about how you will regulate type certification uh, in the next step, how you will regulate licensing or, or uh, operation over countries, free airspace in Europe and so on. Uh, these are questions, but I insist that it takes time for this. We can't uh, prepare it now and immediately. Our discussion with Jan and me is that we had our political slogan we are fighting for a safe uh, payload and not for heavier aircraft. Results in this formula 350 kilogram empty weight, 250 kilogram uh, payload. It's reasonable and it was probably successful. But uh, in the discussion about the German technical requirements, with our LBA, and the LBA is our Civil Aviation Authority and is responsible for these technical requirements. And they didn't accept this formula, 350 and uh, 250 uh, payload. Uh, they said, we want to have 220 kilogram for uh, pilots, and one hour fuel for cruising speed, which ends probably in 235. <laughs> and this is different now for the moment from the check requirement. But all other physics are the same in Czech and in Germany. And the example Germany and Czech is important in so far that uh, we had for a long, long time an agreement for mutual recognition of type certificates. The German accepted the Czech type certificate and the Czechs accepted the Germans. And this is a very, very good example how we can step forward in Europe uh, where the rule is coming down from the top uh, everything is uh, equal by the EASA uh, and we do it from the bottom 
So, in this way, the mutual recognition is also a, a way to harmonize the market in Europe. So, I think we have the same physics and slightly different in the empty weight and uh, uh, a payload. That's all. Yes, I will start from the end. I think that the mutual recognition is the way. And I think that was our secret trick which we wanted to achieve. That basically each national uh, country or each uh, member state for ultralights will keep their airworthiness rules. But the trick would be that we will try to achieve that these rules inside will be the same. The biggest chance to achieve that is between Czech Republic and Germany because historically in 1990 when we established the LAA, at that time Czech CAA said copy the German rules. So that's why about 10 or years ago we were able to achieve that uh, mutual recognition for type certificates because 90% of or 95% of our rules were same. The only difference were at that time the in Czech, the rescue system is not mandatory, some forces to uh, rescue system attachment points, some forces for, for seed and, and some small things. And of course, some problems with the empty weight definition. That's why we started this discussion with Joe and the Deutsche Air Club as well, that uh, by having these realistic numbers, 600 and 350 empty, we can actually eliminate most of the differences and the code could be the same. Uh, I think we need to fix this uh, empty weight uh, or different approach which Germany took in the, in the last, but it's still possible. I agree that the physics is the same, but as you can see around the Europe, there is many more ultralights and each member states have a different rules, even the physics is the same. Uh, UK is our friends here sitting is another example that their definition of empty weight actually eliminates most of the of the rest of Europe manufactured uh, ultralight to be successfully certified in, in UK with 350 kilo and 600 kilo we had that opportunity and if I now go back to the uh, question how we will do it in Czech I think it's from from my point of view you know I'm simple man and I like simple things we, I think we have a solution because the current type certificates are valid up to the weight which is stated in the type certificate. For the new planes, the new rules will apply. For the old planes, if the owner wish to upgrade, he will have a chance to upgrade to the weight which his plane can sustain. It, is, it doesn't mean that from day one, because we expect that in Czech Republic this will be valid from 1st January uh, 2019, that all planes must be 600 kilo. No way. Only the planes which are able to prove how much they can sustain. Some planes can, all designs can maybe sustain 500, maybe 520. It's fine. But the big people from day one will have a choice. So they could fly better or they could fly alone or with small children or something and slowly maybe in a period of 10 years we will clean this situation that most of the planes with uh, 912 engines are flying overweight. Uh, Jan, uh, you just mentioned now a certain date. You think uh, that this uh, rule in Czech Republic could be applicated in January 1st, 20, 2019? Joe, do you have no, I, I will tell you why. Our government are telling us, if European Parliament will vote and approve a new basic regulation by end of May or June, it will take in Czech Republic six, six months to adapt the national regulations. LA must ask for the extension of our uh, delegation from the government. And then they think that the 1st January 2019 is, it, is realistic. Is it realistic? You have a, a guess, because I'm sure you also can say it will be this date, because it's not in your hands, Joe. But uh, do you, what do you think it will be in Germany? I, I think it will be also in Germany autumn this year. Uh, yeah, we will see. Uh, I cannot promise, but uh, I have to point out that 
we did our homework, we prepared everything uh, to start immediately after the European uh, decision uh, in the Parliament. So, so it will be, just for clarification, there will be new, uh, we call it in German Bauvorschriften, or it will be just a modification of the existing one? It is just a modification, uh, with very, very slightly amendments there, uh, just about uh, the payload uh, and uh, so the empty weight definition, uh, probably four or five numbers are changed in our technical requirement. Another clarification, just, uh, I know the answer, but perhaps there has been uh, uh, not discussions. So, between Czech and Germany, the uh, takeoff weight is clear and also the uh, maximum speed is both countries will go to the 83 kilometers uh, in landing configuration. This is a figure which is agreed and will be in the rules in both countries. Unfortunately, yes, the Czech Republic proposed 75 kilometers per hour because we, this would come from the physics, but we accept that our German colleagues or may, maybe the most of the other governments will go for the maximum what will be allowed in this uh, new opt-out condition. So with uh, very not uh, good uh, feelings, we will have in Czech 83 kilometers per hour slow speed in landing configuration as well. Insane, no, because we want to have a, this United regulation? I understand, uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's clear for the rule it will be 83 in Czech Republic and 83 in Germany. And because this is a limit which was set in this basic rules, so uh, we have two points already which will be the modification in both rules. Uh, do you think uh, both, for both sides there will have to be any modification in the pilots? licensing or do you think you can the pilot's licensing will stay like it is? I already said in Czech Republic I don't expect any other modification than the airworthiness code. Okay, so um, I think we have the basic information right now. So um, we have some more microphones. So uh, if anybody has a question, I will keep on asking questions, but if anybody of you has a question, just raise a hand and we'll get you a microphone and then you can uh, uh, can start there. So my next question would be, how do you think, because when we look at this map, we see there are some countries which have a different color. Uh, to these countries, would uh, up to now, for example, to uh, Litauen, Lithuania, you could fly with a micro light. Now it has a different color. Would it be possible to f still fly to these countries? What do you do? You have already a concrete answer, or what you expect will be the answer? Yeah. First of all, this map is not about where it is possible to fly. This map is showing which countries uh, at that meeting voted for 600 kilo opt out or not. The thing is that. As I said in my opening speech, because they took out 600 kilo opt out from Annex 2, this, this means that this Annex aircraft, the dead definition 450 and 472 and a half stays there. So these planes are okay. So I don't see any reasons why these planes will no, fly. The good. question is how will how will be the flying with 600 kilo for countries which have a different definition of opt-out. And this is difficult to answer. So, so there has not been any concrete discussions with countries like uh, I think these discussions must be done on the member states level. This I cannot No, but, but And I think the, the main reason why, uh, I'm happy that even now it's a little bit more people than at the beginning, you must lobby in your home that you want to have the same rules. We cannot do it in, instead of you from Czech or from Germany. Each member association or pilots of ultralight airplanes, they must do their homework at home. Now that's why we wanted to have this discussion here at the Aero, because we know that there are a lot of manufacturers from other European countries. So uh, your point of view on this crossing frontiers with a new 600 kilogram ultralight, how you expect it will be regulated, Joe? 
sorry. Yeah, you and, uh, so, so when when I had my German 600 kilogram ultralight in no, uh, May 2019, and I want to fly uh, to to Italy over Austria or to France. Um, how do you think this, or do you think there will be a solution, or do you think it will be said, no, it's not possible to fly? We will ask the same question to the French as well, so we will inform you on the answers on their side, but I would like to know your opinion. <coughs> I'm absolutely sure that there will be a solution, but I can't say how it is. This, this, uh, uh, this, yeah, this is, uh, at this time, this is quite difficult. Especially uh, Austria, it's interesting for the German pilots flying to Austria or to Italy. Uh, but uh, we have to say that uh, the Austrians did all the time different rules from the Germans or other European countries, but they accepted everything. So it, there is no need to discuss it uh, in this way because I'm absolutely sure that there will be uh, a possibility or a solution. Uh, interesting for me is that more and more countries, they were very, very strong against 600 kilogram. Now they come up and said, oh, 600 kilogram opt out, it could be also possible for us, so we will do it. I think about the Dutch, uh, Spain and, and so on. Now they are very open-minded to 600, but all these years where we fight it for 600, they were strongly against 600. So that's quite stupid. So from this point, I, I can't say how it will develop, uh, uh, but I'm absolutely sure that worldwide 600 kilogram is a running train. So, yeah. So one uh, additional question, so perhaps it would be a proposal because I know you started this website for the 600 kilogram, perhaps it would be good as soon uh, to update a map there and then giving the information there how it's developing. Because I think that this is really a very valid information which uh, people want to know and for most of them here at the show, which is uh, their business, they make their living with it, it's essential to know how it's uh, it's going on. But there is one more thing where uh, there was always circling the questions we had it in the editorial office when people, when it came through that the 600 kilo will be there. So how will be the difference? Just a quick answer. How will be the difference? Because there is 600 kilogram LSA and now there is 600 kilogram ultralight. So how will be the difference of operating into, for example, as I know in Germany, uh, it is that with a 600 kilogram CSLSA, you may do private pilot training. With an ultralight, you do ultralight training and only some of the hours are recognized for private pilot training. So this is a very practical question for flight schools, for example, if they are ordering, uh, let's say, Technam, which has a CSLSA, or a Technam, which has a, a ultralight certification with 600 kilogram, which I'm very sure will come at some point. I think it's quite difficult to uh, divide this. Uh, technically, I think the machines are very, very similar. Uh, or, uh, but from the bureaucratic point of view, it is quite dif uh, different. Uh, I believe that the big advantage for EASA type certificate and also the EASA licenses is those are valid all over Europe. Uh, that's a very, very big advantage. But uh, this advantage has a very, very high price, I think. And I do believe that we, on the national level, the Czech, the Germans, different other countries, we provide type certificates and licensing much more cheaper. So, and I'm very, very optimistic that we will achieve someday that, or, or one day, uh, that we will get a cross-crediting between these licenses. Uh, this should be also a aim for us. So it means that 
if you have an autolite license, one day you will operate also an LSA, uh, EASA, uh, CSLSA, and so on. This should be the way uh, how we can come together. Uh, but it's not in our hand. We will see what, uh, how the position of EASA is and so on. That's a long, long debate. Okay, Jano. It's a shame that 10 or 11 years ago, EASA didn't listen to us and they didn't create the reasonable rules for LSA, which would be based very close to German or Czech rules, and then it would work. I think that the current, currently EASA uh, rules for LSA don't work for private persons quite well. It, they work for uh, flight schools, because that's the only way how they can train, and because the other big, bigger ones are too expensive. Completely agree. I made a, uh, many years ago, I made a study the case study, which was the difference on a cost certification between the classical ultralight airplanes, LSA in the United States, where is a cell declaration, and EASA type certificate, uh, restricted type certificate. You know, the, the cost of the certification is the delta between the EASA RTC and the ultralight of the same type, because data from one of the manufacturers of the same, same time is more than 300,000 euro just on certification. So I think from that point of view, there is no competition. The danger is that now, because these numbers are same, EASA will not be happy about that because they were not happy when, when this happened because they said, if you will do that, we will not continue support the lower end of the aviation. Uh, I don't know how this will continue. That the danger is that there will be bureau bureaucratic obstacles to make our flying less attractive, less possible, less press credit, uh, etc. But it is on a national level, so I'm pretty sure that in Czech Republic our relationship with our government is so good that we would be able to protect our pilots. And I think it's fair to say I'm really interested for up to 600 kilo. Those who want to fly simple rules must fight for them above this 600 kilo. I'm flying ultralight, I would, now I have a possibility to fly with my weight, realistic, uh, legally ultralight and I am happy. And I will do my best to keep it this way. Okay, um, the next question would be, at the beginning of the 600 kilogram debate, there was some point, I think, when the European Commission started the initiative, um, that with, ultra, with electric ultralight, there is no, uh, a very little way to achieve it with 450 or 472.5 kilogram because the energy density of the batteries is so much lower than the one of fuel. Now, as the 600 kilo will come, do you expect many more electric aircraft in your territory? Let's say first to Joe now. Um, do you expect more 3x controlled? electric uh, ultralight uh, or do you think most of this electric aircraft will likely go to EASA? It's hard to say. Uh, I think that the, the door is more open now with 600 kilograms for electric. That's uh, clear. But I, I think it depends on the market. Yeah, what the customer wants and what the manufacturers provide. Uh, so it's hard to say, uh, but very important for this is our view uh, is that you can use this, uh, no, we don't talk anymore about fuel, we talk about energy, which means that you will handle the uh, energy storage with a, uh, this a battery at least, as the fuel, so you can take with you 100 uh, uh, kilogram fuel or 100 kilogram battery. So, and from this, I say that the door is much more uh, uh, wider open. So there, but are there already several requests from company, for example, who are looking and waiting until the 600 kilogram number, you know, where are you aware they're working on electric aircraft or is it just to come? Is it, uh, will be developed? 
it's just for, for I'm, as I'm interested in electric aviation, I'm thinking how long you think it will take to that some aircraft will be on the market, like the Pippi's trail. Will you give this question to Jan? I'm not a promoter for electric flying. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you have an electric aircraft. Yes, I, I uh, fly an uh, electric aircraft, but I think it's a stupid tool. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so it's interesting when Joe called me a promoter of the electric aircraft. I like uh, new things, but I also don't like if it goes to the extreme. And sometimes uh, I know that electric is sexy, but I hate the situation that somebody says it's the ultimate solution for aviation. For me, it's not. Because at the moment, if you count the, the energy which you need to produce the electric and compare it with combustion engine, I, I still think that the combustion engine has uh, the first place at the moment. But this doesn't mean that I will not support any new possible thing. We already have we already have in Czech Republic for five or six years this ELSA category, which is this 600 kilo and 350 empty. That's why all Czech uh, electric aircraft are this ELSA category, and we are flying it for five years legally. But as I said, it, it needs to have some time, and it's a question if the final solution is electric or it's hybrid or something else. It's definitely a very interesting uh, area, but uh, Practically, at the moment, the price, the cost issue for the private person, if it's not Elon Musk or somebody like that, it's a little bit out of the bucket. Okay, so also uh, you would say you also don't expect to have, because uh, one thing, apart from energy, one big argument, I think, for electric aircraft would be the noise point of view, because in Germany we have a lot of problems with noise in I, nearly every airfield I know where there is a flight school, they have problems, train on the weekend because of noise problems. And if you see, and yesterday you could hear again that the noise level is lower definitely of an electric aircraft, so would you expect some schools changing to electric aircraft very soon or you, how long you think it the way? No, uh, I don't believe that uh, they will change uh, the propulsion uh, unit very soon, just from the noise aspect, not yeah, because it's not uh, as big as many people talk about it. So we have not really a uh, noise trouble in Germany as well, and not a big debate about this. Um, I I think especially Pipistrel, they have a very good uh, way to implement uh, electric. Uh, in a glider, I think this makes sense. Uh, if you are interested in flying uh, without propulsion, then you can have uh, a help to start, and it's very easy and very fine. I, it was a pleasure to fly uh, Taurus uh, Electro, and it was really fantastic. Uh, but for this, you must be a glider pilot. You must be interested in gliding. Uh, yeah, but for our normal ultralights, uh, I think it's a very long way that you can fly from Friedrichshafen to Hamburg uh, electric. No, that's, what I, that's why I said, not for traveling, that's why I said uh, yeah. concerning uh, tra flight training. Because I can tell you, for example, we have a flight from Jesenwag, which is one of the very few flight schools around Munich and there uh, uh, there is no training on the weekends and there were discussed where they said if it's remarkable lower noise and it is if you look at the aircraft there, there some of these fields could be the first steps okay I accept I, I'm absolutely sure there are some uh, niche where you can uh, help uh, have a helpful tool for that and so that's okay uh, but 100% of pilots are not interested in Okay, no, that's for sure. Zian, what do you think? Do you think in Czech Republic? And there are several Czech manufacturers showing electric aircraft here. Yes, we have, and we have some good concept now, yes. this Phoenix concept, which is 
also with the network of the charges and everything. I think it will develop. I am not aware that we have so big noise problem, but I'm pretty sure that if we solve the noise, those people who are against... So this is my diet to keep me eating, to lose the weight, sorry. <laughs> By the way, that was, I lost 20 kilograms and that was a, the easiest way how to decrease or increase the payload. So you can try it, I can tell you. Uh, so, uh, but uh, I think if we solve the noise problem, those people who are against, they will find something else to beat us. So I don't think, and the noise is mostly coming from the propeller. So. Uh, we will, we will see. I, I, as I said, LAA supports our manufacturers with the electric things, but uh, it's an early stage and I think that at, when, at the time when it will come to the proper uh, sort of market use or proper selling, the question is if the, our standards are uh, really strong enough concerning all these electricity issues, connectivity issues, interference and all that stuff. One thing is, you know, this is good for the development, but maybe then it's time for EASA or, or when they do it for commercial uh, purposes. No, okay, understood. Uh, I just ask again in the round here, is, are there any questions from you where you have questions to 600 kilogram? I was actually expecting some more uh, questions, so perhaps Joe was right, everybody knows everything already, um, so I just have to ask. Als erstes möchte ich ganz, ganz herzlichen Dank sagen. Ich finde es ganz, ganz toll. Ich fliege seit 15 Jahren UL, dass es geklappt hat, dass wir künftig im UL-Bereich mit 600 Kilo fliegen können. Das war nicht immer so. Wir waren immer am Rande der Kriminalität. Und nur dieses permanente Durchhalten, dass ihr das geschafft habt. Herzlichen Dank. Die Harmonisierung, das geht voran. Ein Wunsch ist jetzt noch, auch die Franzosen, die jetzt im Gewicht noch nicht ganz mitspielen, haben doch ein anderes tolles Feature, nämlich das abgeschaffte Medical for UL. Wie geht es denn dort weiter, dass wir auch hier vereinfachte Bedingungen bekommen können, um hier glücklich bis an unser Lebensende UL fliegen zu können? You know, I wrote it, everything, what I want to say here. No need for a new regulation. You know, the thing is, we are flying until now, so... Do you think you need to change anything? You think that you will fly a different plane? No. But, again, Annex 1, or this national regulation has its pluses and minuses. The plus is, if the government is clever, or friendly, or reasonable, the rules are reasonable. But if the government has a different ideas, the rules will be bad and the system will not work. So, in Czech Republic, I don't have, have I don't expect any changes on that, because I think it's not necessary. And I think in France, if they are flying the plane, as far as I know, even they pretend they have a different rules, they are flying the same plane like, like us, so why they would need to change their rules? If for their society is acceptable, have no medical for uh, ultralights, keep them. But no, but the question is, it is not directly connected with 600 kilograms, but it's a totally different discussion in several countries, like yet in the United States, to have some uh, that you don't need a strict medical for aviation, perhaps a lighter medical. And so, in Czech there is no, uh, as I understand, there is no movement, no uh, activity reducing the medical. Joe, in Germany, uh, is there any, because I know for the 120 kilogram class it was reduced, is there any chance that it also will be reduced for the normal ultralight license? 
We fight it uh, two years ago or three years ago. We fight it for uh, freedom of medical in uh, for ultralights in Germany, uh, but uh, we couldn't achieve it. It was a political debate about, um, and uh, they said no. Uh, it's necessary having this medical. But I believe in your question behind was the aim that we are still fighting against bureaucratic burdens. And uh, this I will promise you, it's my hobby. <laughs> yeah, I think it's necessary to keep the bureaucratic on the lowest level as possible, but in the same time it is not possible to fight all around. So I think uh, we had a priority to solve not 600 kilo. We the weight, the realistic payload was our case. We are not 600 kilo is a result, but it, the, it really doesn't matter too much if we. The problem is that this European Commission in this regulation didn't specify that it was for load. So from that point of view, if we would have 600 kilo, and if, if we will not set in Czech Republic the payload, we didn't achieve anything. We just moved the problem to the higher weights. So, uh, um, some more questions? keep a little bit back to the discussion about the noise limit. Uh, my question is uh, whether there will be a noise limit for the 600 kilograms category because we know in the Czech there is no limit for ultralights. In Germany currently there is uh, I believe 60 decibels. So the question is for this 600 kilos if Germany is going to uh, increase this limit or what will be the situation? Thank you. For Germany I can say uh, we will get an open window in noise question. Uh, this 60 dB uh, will be cancelled uh, in the next few months. Uh, our new regulation in Germany will be uh, the normal ICAO standard, what you have for uh, single engine piston machines. And so that's absolutely no debate anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Das, das war im Wesentlichen auch meine Frage, äh, was sich da in dem Neues-Sektor äh, tut. Zum anderen wollte ich noch was zu dem Medical sagen. Als Ultraleichtflieger haben wir es ja sowieso relativ leicht, das Medical zu erreichen, weil wir das Lappel äh, nur benötigen und nicht mehr Class 2. Von daher sind ja einige Hürden ausgenommen. Im, im Lappel Medical ist ja einiges an Krankheiten mehr möglich ohne dass man die äh, Befähigung zum Führen eines Luftfahrzeugs verliert. Uh, uh, just uh, give some update in English for the other list. Uh, I think just behind you was another question. Just behind you. Um, so uh, the, the answer uh, or uh, amendment was that he stated that now for the ultralight license you need different med medical. So Joe's fight for uh, less bureaucracy was already partly successful, but he, uh, we say, there still is some time to go because I think if you see that you at some points can drive very heavy trucks or relatively heavy trucks without medical, but for a small aircraft you need a medical, there is still some space where we can fight. Although you're right, it is already less for ultralight. So, yes? Yo. Uh, my, name is, my name is Anno Menzel, I support uh, manufacturers with a certification and one thing really interesting for me was we get 600 kilo, fantastic, but we still struggle with the old LTF regulations which are quite different to, for example, the LSA standard in America, ASTM standards which for me, if you read the standards, they are really fantastic. They, they did their homework, they are clearly written, their physics is clear, and, well, I wish, or it would be fantastic if we would in 
future or that we could adapt to standards like LSA standards, for example, because, um, for example, tail loading in LTF is much higher than um, uh, VLA or LSA loadings. Uh, landing gear loadings are different. VNE is much higher, VD, design top speed, design is much higher, and so on and so on. And it uh, would be quite fantastic if we could adapt one thing and adjusted the, um, the medical for uh, truck drivers, and th they were really tough in so, Germany. Uh, okay, let, let me answer, please. Uh, Arno, it, I know it's, it's, it's quite difficult to compare uh, ASTM to uh, German technical requirements, also. It's, it's <laughs> difficult. Uh, everybody is... But physical, the thing. No, it's not physical the same, because you have uh, different uh, standards in US ASTM uh, in, uh, in the LSA definition. Think about uh, uh, retractable gear and 200 kilo, uh, kilometer per hour and so on. It's, it's difficult and I do believe that ASTM is an other structure. Uh, ASTM means consensus standard. It's not uh, a testing procedure behind. It well, isn't. It's yes, all, it, yes and no. And no. It's, it's very, very hard uh, to compare it. And I have to say, our German technical requirements are derivates from uh, federal aviation requirements since 50 years or more and then we had uh, char uh, joint aviation requirements and from this we become this and our older uh, technical requirements exist then since uh, 15 years and nobody has a problem with it just nowadays when we get 600 kilogram we should operate according to ASTM. Why this? There is absolutely no need. Uh, Anna, please, uh, please let also Jan answer to the question. I think uh, that we have two points of view as ASTM is an international standard. And I would also like to have the uh, point of view uh, of... Yeah, I think your question is logical. But we made a political decision that we will stick with European rules, which we, are, we have a tradition. All our system, all the, uh, our technicians know the Czech rules. And because they are 90% or 95% same with Germany, we stick for that. In ASTM, many years ago, I tried to introduce the, uh, uh, this realistic payload. And I didn't succeed it because we were not able to find a consensus. And if you know it detailly how it happened, no you know, especially on the LSA side, the way how it is, uh, uh, how the rules are created are really fast and interesting and consensus, providing that all major players will participate. And my personal opinion is that the manufacturer here is uh, to produce the planes for the customers, not mainly create the rules. The result of this system is that the ASTM rules for LSA are not created by the major players in that field. And uh, I'm not very happy about that. So we made a political decision that we will stick with Czech and German rules. Simple like that. I know that it would be better to have a one worldwide standard, but at the moment it's not possible to fight on all possible ways. And we have a 200 Czech uh, uh, inspect technical inspectors which are working in the field, they are familiar with the Czech rules uh, and we will stick with that. I will give you a quite interesting example. Uh, I studied the ASTM rescue uh, system standard to compare it to the Germans. And when I did this work, I missed one single number for the sink rate on the deployed uh, rescue system. What is in, in the ASTM standard? There, there is no number, no figure for that for a sink rate. 
Um, and I found at least the uh, this description, the sink crate must be survivable. What, is not what the fucking paper <laughs> is that? <laughs> so, but maybe um, the problem is that we have many aircraft producers here in Germany selling to America. And now we have two different standards for the same aircraft, 600 kilos, but with the same store speed and so on and so on. That something which should be the real would be good. Is the same. Say it would be good to be adapted. No, uh, I think we, we all agree that it would be good to have the same standard if you agree on it. But on the other hand, just saying, uh, I think that's the point of view of Joe and uh, Jan, as I discussed this matter also with them several times. That, um, if you agree to a standard, you also must accept the standard and say the standard is good. Not only for having the same standard, accepting any standard is not what they wanted. But perhaps there is any... I think we got the point, so I don't, uh, any other questions? Because we uh, are finishing at the time and they have a quite tight uh, schedule here. Uh, so I have to close this discussion. Like I said before, any answer, we record this. We have some more interesting discussions coming up during the uh, uh, show here. For example, on uh, autonomous flight, on electric flying and on other developments. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you to Joe, thank you to Jan. And um, yeah, I, I'm sure the discussion will continue. Sorry, uh, but we have to keep this guy. Thank you.